Hello and welcome to Rogue Library and welcome to Brogue. Brogue is a roguelike in the very traditionalist sense of the word. Uh, the game was built on the tradition of the old school roguelikes in which you start on one floor, like in, for example, NetHack or Rogue. You start on one floor, you have to progress all the way down to the bottom floor. At which point you have to uh, retrieve a MacGuffin, usually the amulet of Yendor, as is the case here. And then you have to go all the way up to the top floor and escape with it. Rogue is, in that sense, a very traditional game, uh, or roguelike, rather, but it is also a very untraditional roguelike in many ways, and I will show you how. We're gonna hit a new game. So first of all, roguelikes uh, generally don't have very, or have a deep focus on graphics. Now, Brogue might not seem like one that does, but it definitely is one that does. Uh, Brogue, like the creator, Brian Walker, which created this game in like 2009 or so, that's when development began, um, seems to have had a very, very deep and, uh, like, deep appreciation for the, you know, traditions of the roguelike genre, but also wanted to add some more spice to the graphics. So, for example, you know, like most traditional roguelikes, you are represented by the at symbol, uh, but he has also created a system, or used a lighting system, which is part of a, um, I believe it is a Python library, or a, a uh, library which is used for a lot of different uh, uh, code bases called, um, or languages called uh, libcod, uh, which uh, I don't know what that, that means, but I've tried to play around with it, and you can see the game has a, you know, vision system like most, uh, but you can also see graphically represented places you can't see, it's got a lighting system, you can see a patch of sunlight here, I'm using my mouse actually to look at stuff which isn't necessarily all that standard for roguelikes. Uh, you can see the water is beautiful. It's flowing. It's, uh, you know, very, it looks uh, very unique. It's got this striking um, uh, sort of visual aesthetic to it that most roguelikes do not. But it still maintains the the ASCII aesthetic as well, because it is a traditionalist roguelike. This is the dungeon exit here. This is a rat, an enemy. Very, uh, you know, very uh, uh, typical to start off with weak enemies on the first floor out of the 26 floors of uh, the Dungeon of Doom. Now, you might be noticing some things like a lot of, um, you know, text boxes pop up when you hover over stuff. Uh, you have almost all information available to you on one, one screen. Uh, this is also kind of uh, part of the old, uh, old like, roguelike tradition where, you know, information and the game is non-modal, everything is shown in one mode, but also, like, uh, it is super intuitive, and that is what I mean by uh, this game is not traditional in that sense, uh, or in the, you know, broadest sense. You dispatch the rat, catching it unaware. There is a stealth system. Uh, the, the game is built specifically to be a modern, but traditional roguelike. It has been built specifically so that you can use the mouse, uh, it has been built so that you can uh, play the game fast uh, in a coffee break, for example, like the old roguelikes. It has been built so that there are multiple strategies for success, and it has been built to have, you know, learned from uh, you like UI design over the past, uh, out of God knows how many years. I can't count anymore to um, like the 1980s, because uh, the 1980s just keep getting further away. At one point, they were 20 years ago. Now, oh God, they're like almost 50 years ago. Uh, so, they're 40 something years ago, uh, since like Rogue came out, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, you, you're automatically picking stuff up when you walk over it. Uh, you have an inventory here. You have unidentified armor, like in the traditional roguelikes, where you would have to identify it, because it might be cursed. You've got unidentified staves and rings. You've got a hunger system, nutrition up here. Like in the most traditional roguelikes, I just killed a kobold in its sleep. You can see in the top there. I now have two sets of plate armor. I'm not going to wear them, because they might be cursed. Uh, you have, um, yeah, you have these, like, unique systems that I have never seen in roguelikes before. And the game is super simple, even though, you know, it has these complex and interesting systems. It's got auto-explore, which a lot of modern roguelikes now have. Just hit X, and it automatically does this for me. Find a chainmail, that might be useful. Uh, you can see that uh, I have one stat, strength, and one stat here, armor. Also, of course, stealth range as well. Uh, the only stat in this game really, is strength, and strength is only raised by one way, or in one way, and that is through potions of strength. That simplifies the whole thing, and really accentuates the whole, like, coffee break thing, where you're, 
you know, not necessarily having to create a character, you know, sort of uh, slaving over a character creation screen for 20 minutes before you can actually get into the game. You just start, everyone starts at the same, uh, with the same basic stuff, and during the first couple of floors, you sort of feel out the build for your character that your character is going to have. It's so neat and clean and, you know, it's just st stripped off all the dust and uh, grime of the genre down and stripped it down to its bare essentials. And I really, really like that. And also, you know, modernized a lot of it. I can hit S to search. You can see searching in the top left here. Uh, just pointed at, at the screen, you can't see me. And uh, Black Potion. And yeah, I, I just really love that. It really shows that Brian Walker, the creator of this game, uh, has a an appreciation and understanding of what the genre came from. And that's also why I think it's cool to make a video on this uh, as one of the first videos in the Rogue Library or Rogue like sorry, library series that I'm making. Uh, I have scrolls, I have potions and I have swords and stuff. So one of the strategies often employed in this game is to not search anything or like check anything or um, uh, you know drink anything or wield anything until you reach the third floor because generally you don't need it on the first floors and then once you reach the third floor we have water which is lucky you start identifying so I'm gonna stand in the water oh shit there's an eel yeah that's also why <laughs> sometimes water is bad eels are super super powerful also when I hover over it it actually tells you the chance for the eel to hit you, and the chance you have to hit the eel, typically. Uh, this game gives you all the information you need. Uh, it does not obfuscate anything. It is so, so clean and so, so, like, neat. But we're standing next to water, so it might be a good idea to start drinking potions. In fact, talking about information being available. Uh, let's see. I think it's menu. Uh, discovered items. They actually tell you the percentage chance for every single item to spawn in the game, so you don't have to go to a wiki to look this up if you want to be, you know, be optimal. The game is so well designed to remove that idea that you need to know everything in order to actually play the game. Like NetHack, for example, in order to win that, you need, like, there are manuals for how to win that game, where you have, like, a specific build you need to uh, uh, get in order to, like, be able to build uh, to win the game because there are so many like very very specific conditions you need to uh, to fulfill in order to win. This game isn't necessarily all that different. It does try to do that as well, but you don't need to look outside of the game for that information. You will see that information when you play the game and learn it and be able to respond to it uh, reactively. So uh, we have a high chance of finding a potion of identify. That is the highest chance, which is why potions are not that bad to drink. Meanwhile, uh, sorry, scrolls. Scrolls are not that bad to use. Uh, meanwhile, potions, we have a highest chance of getting a Detect Magic or a Telepathy Potion. So let's find out what this one is. Sign Potion. Apply. Must be a bit of Potion of Strength. Now my strength is 13, which means that I can actually wear Chainmail, this is the strength requirement, without it hampering me. Uh, in combat, that is. Black Potion, let's drink that. Potion of Telepathy. I can now see every creature on the floor. So you can see them here with their health bars and everything, what they're doing. All information is given to you at all times. Uh, let's uh, drink a white potion. Uh, it causes the floor to collapse and I fall to the next floor. And I got very lucky because I landed on the edge of lava. I think you can't fall into lava like that, down a floor, because that would be very, very annoying for people. Uh, also, another unique feature of this game, you cannot attack, uh, attack uh, through corners, so... Uh, that creates a situation where holding inside a doorway is just as effective as holding on the on one side of a doorway. That is a goblin conjurer. They are annoying, so I'm going to try to let them pass. He walked past me. He hasn't spotted me. I'm going to try to sneak attack him. I killed him. Uh, goblin conjurers create spectral blades. Very annoying to deal with. Uh, this is a candlelit altar. Uh, adult with candles that flicker in the breeze. I don't know what that does. There's a lot of st stuff that's just like decorative and stuff, but you, do you see this lighting? It's so cool. I love it. Uh, let's see. That's a jelly. Uh, they split up. If you attack them. A lot of, uh, oh god. A lot of archetypal uh, enemies here. I need to, I need to run. I'm, I'm probably going to die here. So now I've got them in a sort of a choke point. I'm going to try the scrolls. Uh, scroll of aggravate monsters. So now all the monsters on, on the floor are going to come after me. That's bad. 
Must have been a scroll of remove curse, okay. <clears throat> that it removes the curse of anything I'm wielding, not wearing, sadly. I'm going to use a staff. Staff of obstruction. I am stuck inside crystal. So was the jelly. This is where we die. Probably. Don't know how to get up from this floor, so... Yeah, this is a dead end. Okay, we're still alive. But yeah, this this game is... Oh, that monkey is... Fleeing from me, so it has blocked the jackals off. Okay, that's really good. Uh, let's tr uh, try reading the scroll. Anti-magic. Oh, I mean, that's not gonna help. Uh, you can't apply an obsidian ring. I'll put it on, though. Don't know what it is. We'll learn. Oh, uh, it's a ring of light. As some of them, you only learn after you've worn it for a while. But yeah, so some of these items can be cursed. This is a very standard roguelike. You need to get down to the 26th floor, get back up again, and that's how you win. It's got RPG mechanics like most uh, roguelikes do, and it's got a very simplified strength system and a very simplified but kind of advanced combat system. Some of the weapons actually have unique mechanics. I didn't pick up any of those, sadly. I've only got a sword. Works like a dagger. You attack things, you bump into, but there are weapons like flails, or uh, rather whips, which attack at range, like two squares away. And there are weapons like pikes that can attack uh, in a straight line through enemies, so you can attack two enemies at a time. There are uh, like weapons with ax like axes that have a um, or that attack one tile and then one tile next to it, or both tiles next to it, or whatever. Uh, stuff like that. It's really cool, and some of them only attack once per two turns, like mauls and stuff, like great hammers and whatnot. And you have to sort of tailor your build to to deal with that. You can also be a pacifist, sort of, where you can uh, dominate monsters and just get a bunch of monsters with you. Uh, sometimes monsters are stuck in cages and you can free them, or you can use wands to, um, uh, to charm them, or staffs, and then you can use wands of empowerment to level them up. And then the monsters can eat a corpse of another monster and gain their intrinsics, like a net hack where you eat corpses. But here the monsters eat the corpses and they l gain their abilities. So if a an ogre that you've charmed eats a... Um, a fire bat, that ogre gets fire immunity. Stuff like that. It's really, really interesting. And, or like a vampire bat, they get life leech. When they attack, they heal. It's really, really cool. I thoroughly recommend you check this game out. It's actually completely free. Uh, there will be a link in the description down below to how where you can download it. And, um, yeah, go buck wild. This game is quick to play, and quick to lose in, and quick to get back in, and, you know, keep learning. I have never in my life actually beaten this game because I'm quite bad at it. Uh, that's about it. Uh, if you are interested in watching more videos like these, uh, then I thoroughly recommend you hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you like the video, uh, please like and comment. Let me know. If there's stuff you think I should change about the video, please let me know as well. Uh, if you would like to reach out to me directly, you can do so following the links in the description down below. There is a link to Twitter, there is a link to Discord, where, where you can talk to me or anyone in the community. Uh, there's a link to the Patreon if you'd like to support me, though I recommend you watch a couple more of my videos before you make that commitment. And, uh... Finally, there's Twitch, where I stream every now and then. Recommend you follow me there as well. And that's about it, I think. I want to say thank you so much for watching this video. And for indulging in this roguelike library experiment that I'm running, and that's about it. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.